Every coach has a scoreboard, consciously or unconsciously, that they use to determine if and when they are succeeding. For some, their scoreboard looks a lot like the scoreboard on the wall of the gymnasium, because for them, success and outscoring opponents are one and the same. It's all about wins and championships. For others, their scoreboards follow their career advancement. These are the coaches that seem to bounce around in search of a better job or a bigger paycheck every other year. And for some, they keep score by looking at the impact that they have had on the lives of those that they have coached. Now, I'm not saying any of these ways of keeping score are illegitimate, but I will suggest that unless a coach's proverbial scoreboard is consistent with their proverbial whiteboard and stopwatch, they're just fooling themselves and others. So what is the stopwatch? The stopwatch represents how the coach invests his or her time. How we invest our time tells us a lot about who we are. When you ask coaches why they coach, they often tell you that they coach to build character or develop youth. For some, they're telling the truth. There are a lot of great coaches out there. We just need more of them. But for others, they're just repeating a meaningless cliche because if you look just a little closer, you'll f see that their words are not exactly consistent with their actions. That is, when they say they're building character or developing youth, they are not, in fact, really doing anything to build character or develop youth. And in the worst co cases, some coaches may be doing the opposite of building character. They may even be making their kids worse rather than better people. To demonstrate what I mean, let me tell you about one of the many baseball coaches that I once played for who claimed to be building character. We'll call him Coach Mendez. We won a lot of games under Coach Mendez, and we liked Coach Mendez. And the reason we won so many games was partly due to the fact that I had a lot of talented teammates, but it was also due to the fact that we cheated quite a bit. In baseball, there are some gray areas between cleverness and outright cheating. For example, Coach Mendez was a serial sign stealer. He would take his position as the first base coach while we were batting, look at the catcher's signal, then relay the signal to us while we were batting by saying our first name if it was going to be a fastball, or our last name if it was going to be a breaking pitch. Not the most honest thing to do, but in the context and culture of baseball, it's a bit of a gray area. But during practices, Coach Mendez would teach us how to use teamwork to cheat and get away with it. He taught us the double squeeze play. The double squeeze play is only possible if you have a runner on second base and third base. And it goes like this. Like any squeeze play, the batter is charged with the task of bunting the ball, no matter how good or bad the pitch. And also like any squeeze play, the runner on third base breaks for home plate as the pitcher goes into his windup. But unlike the conventional squeeze play, the runner on second also heads for home plate, but does so by bypassing third base toward the third base line before turning for home. Coach Mendez explained the psychology of the double squeeze play to my teammates and I. When the runner on third goes with the pitch, all eyes are on the runner as he breaks for home and on the catcher as he gets in position to make the tag. And in the excitement of the moment, the attention of everyone, the players, the fans, and the umpires, tends to focus exclusively on the play at the plate. So even the field umpire who is stationed behind the pitcher, doesn't see that the runner on second base takes a rather unconventional route to home play. And the pitcher, catcher, and infielders are usually too busy reeling from the disappointment of giving up a run to notice that a second runner is sprinting towards home play. To pull off the double squeeze play, 
Timing is key. We use the double squeeze play successfully several times in games and only got caught once by an opposing coach who pointed to the footsteps of our creative base runner in the freshly raked dirt. But neither the umpire saw the play, so the challenge at third base was denied and our runner was safe at home. So if not getting caught was the sole criteria for an action being right or wrong, Coach Mendez was clearly in the right. Every coach has a proverbial whiteboard, which represents what they are teaching. By implementing the double squeeze play, what was Coach Mendez really teaching us? Obviously, he was teaching us another way to score runs effectively through innovative base running. But on a deeper level, it would be hard to argue that he was developing youth or building character. Sure, teamwork and precise timing are important life skills, but this was taking small ball to a new level. I think what we really learned is that cheating is just another way to accomplish your goals and that if you don't get caught, it's not really wrong. Consider what this says about Coach Mendez's scoreboard. He may have said that he coached to build character but it seems that if he were honest with himself, he would have to face the fact that he was really keeping score by just tallying runs scored in games won. And consider what his stopwatch says about his coaching. Not only did he not invest time in anything that could possibly build character in his players, the sin, a sin of omission, but he did invest time in teaching his players to cheat and not get caught, a sin of commission. For those whose words and actions are consistent, they're able to honestly answer the following three questions. What are you teaching? How are you keeping score? And where are you investing your time? If you look closely at the best coaches, those who have sustained success for years or even decades, you will find that they are most interested in impacting lives and that winning games and championships are usually a byproduct of their focus on serving others. And often you find that these coaches are more interested in the advancement of their players than their own career advancement. For example, rather than taking a job with a more prestigious program, Frosty Westering chose to stay at Pacific Lutheran University, where he became one of the winningest coaches in college football history. And the title of his book, Make the Big Time Where You Are, provides a hint at what he was all about. Frosty kept score not only in wins and championships, but by looking at the lives that he had impacted in a positive way. And he invested his time valuable practice time in teaching his players life lessons. And I doubt that he would have taught the double squeeze play had he been a baseball rather than a football coach. Frosty's scoreboard and whiteboard and stopwatch were aligned. The scoreboard, whiteboard, and stopwatch of Coach Mendez, not so much. It is obviously up to you to decide what you will teach, where you will invest your time, and how you will ultimately keep score. There are lots of reasonable answers to these questions, and personal ambition isn't necessarily a bad thing. And the demands of the situation may influence your answers to these three important questions. Priorities may look a little different for baseball coaches working in competitive leagues focus on talent development, rather than recreational programs focus on providing a fun learning experience for kids. I don't know the details of your situation, but my guess is that you will probably be more likely to succeed if your scoreboard and whiteboard and stopwatch are aligned.